At this year's c &E, some shows were bombs and some were sellouts. One of those sellouts was Burton Cummings, who put more than 20,000 people into the grandstand. That's nothing new for Burton. He's been packing stadiums and concert halls since the days of the Guess Who. His success has brought overwhelming rewards. He owns a 21-room mansion in Winnipeg, a home in Sherman Oaks, California, a shopping center in Manitoba, and just bought a bank in California. Even after the Guess Who met a stormy end, Burton Cummings has gone on to outlast fellow band member Randy Bachman's BTO and numerous projects by other former Guess Who personnel. Part of the reason for his success is that he's a hard-drinking, hard-playing rock and roller who can write a pretty ballad. Since starting his solo career, Cummings has seen two albums go platinum, and his last LP, Dream of a Child, almost four times that mark. That makes him the biggest thing in Canadian music history. Audiences in the States, Australia, and Japan are as familiar with his music as people in Winnipeg, and he never fails to thrill the crowds at his annual c &E performance. Central Canadian, Burton has never thought music had national boundaries. And when the CRTC decided to legislate mandatory Canadian content on our radio stations, Burton spoke out strongly against that policy. I can remember saying publicly that I thought it was the worst thing in the world, that you can't legislate an art form, that you can't tell people what they should like, and it was an infringement on uh, the airwaves and democracy and blah, blah, blah. I must retract that in part because I think the end has justified the means. I really do. And I don't know if the means was correct, but certainly now I hear better Canadian records, more of them, much more international credibility from, from Canadian artists. Uh, Gino Vanelli and Murray, they've had smash records this year. Uh, I hear a lot more Canadian things on the air when I'm in Los Angeles, when I'm in Chicago, New York, Miami. It really has come an awfully long way in two or three years. And as far as my own success, I'm, I'm just proud and happy and feel very lucky to have been a part of that. You know, uh, certainly I, I can't take credit for all that, but I'm, I'm very pleased to be in on what I call the ground floor of the Canadian gold rush. There really is something happening up here now, not just in records, but in films, you know. Man, you walk around Toronto, there are more movie stars here than there are in L.A., you know. Uh, they're always shooting... I mean, it's, it's great. It's a very exciting time for Canadians. Yeah, but you've chosen to uh, live in L.A. Temporarily. I, I am moving back. I, uh, I've made my contacts, and I have enough inroads now, and I really don't want to stay there, you know, forever. I, I never did plan to stay forever. It was always a temporary move. I got very accustomed to the L.A. lifestyle and, and, and moving within the, the upper echelon of the studio musicians and the rock and roll people and watching producers and engineers and seeing how good records are made. But all that information, <clears throat> excuse me, all that information that I've assimilated now, I, I must get out of L.A. to sort out. Otherwise, it does me no good. I'm just on overload, you know, and you can only ingest so much without getting away and sorting it out. What about your social life? Go to any of those wild and crazy parties we hear so much about? Oh, I've, yeah, I've 
done all that, you know, it's, uh, I'm not really into that whole running with the pack scene. It's, I mean, I, I go to my lawyer's office, I bump into Gregory Peck and Warren Beatty and Steve McQueen and Jagger and guys like that, and they're just like anybody else. You know, it's, I was devastated when I first moved there because I would, I would be running into these huge, tremendous stars constantly. After a while, the fascination with that really wears off. They're just people like anyone else. And in L.A., that sooner or later becomes commonplace, you know? And I don't really run with the pack. I don't hang out at the premiere parties and stuff like that. It's, it's convenient for recording because it's just a 15-minute drive down the hill. It's very convenient for national television to do... I've done Merv Griffin and Dinah Shore and a lot of those things, and it's a 10-minute drive down the hill as opposed to before, you know, flying there, taking a whole day, then taping the show, doing another day, and then flying home, being a whole other day. So it has its conveniences, but as cliche as this may sound, the air is filthy. The air is not fit to breathe anymore. And I, you don't realize it until you get out of L.A. I come back up here and I, I can't believe I sing better, I sleep better at night. Uh, what do you do for fun? Mm, I drink cold beer, I stay up late and play loud music. <laughs> Uh, I go to the movies a lot. I really like the movies. I'm still... When I see a really good film, I become five years old again, you know? And I'm, I've always been fascinated with film. And I, I'm even taking acting lessons to, to learn what it is to play your bodily emotions the way a good musician plays an instrument, you know? And that's really what acting is about. So I want to try and master that craft uh, and see if I can create some characters on the screen the way I create songs. What about the fans? How much do you get off on the attention they give you? I, I enjoy the attention. I would be a liar if I said I didn't like it. Uh, that's probably what drew me into show business to begin with, you know. Uh, when you can make a few thousand people stand up and cheer, it's, there's no feeling in the world like that. There's, there's nothing that can do that. I don't think there's a drug or a woman or a, a liquor or anything i don't think there's anything in the world that can give you that buzz it's like it's as though you're being plugged into a wall socket and a current of electricity is running right through your body like when i walked off the stage last night after one or two encores and the applause was literally deafening i could not hear it was so loud i couldn't hear it you know what i mean it was just deafening and it, it hits me sometimes my god that's for us you know that's for me and my band and uh it's just, it's a great thing. I love it. I really do. I'll tour forever. As long as, you know, God willing, I've got a voice and, and people will show up. I'll tour forever. Does the trip ever get lonely? I live the life of a loner, basically. You know, I, uh, but I don't mind that so much. I kind of, I like spending time by myself. Uh, I like playing in my own head. Sometimes I, I like my own company better than anybody else's. And I get a chance to read a lot of books that way and, and, and listen to an awful lot of records and tapes. So I don't, it, it is lonely, but that's uh, an occupational hazard. It, with any career that demands as much travel as, as mine or, you know, other recording artists, you're going to find that, you know. I don't think that... Uh, uh, the only one I can think of that's really pulled it off is McCartney. He takes his entire family on the road with him, so it's really not like being on the road. But to ask a woman to... Uh, <laughs> to say, all right, honey, come on, let's just go now, and you come on tour with me, and then we'll go home together, and then you come to Australia with me. That's madness. You can't have that. It's crazy. Yeah, but some women obviously wouldn't mind it. Well, they might not mind it for a while, but I've been doing it for 12 or 15 years, so I don't know if... Uh... Ever think of yourself as a sex symbol? No. My God, no. Furthest thing from it. Really. Why not? I mean, you don't think that the trip... That, I mean, isn't there a, a touch of that in every uh, rock and roll star? Don't you think? I think that... I think that if everyone in the world were blind, my career would be just as good. You know, my career would be just as successful as it is now. I don't think that the visual... Well, has... yeah, but uh, well, I'm not just talking about visual, though. Come on, there's a lot of uh, sexy well, stuff as, happening in sound. <laughs> as, as far as the sound, perhaps, I guess... Um, it's hard to be objective. That's a loaded <laughs> question. I do not think of myself in any way, shape, or form as a sex symbol. I really, I really don't. I and mean, if, if other people do, that's wonderful. Folks, I love you, you know, but I mean, I, I don't. I really don't. Okay, well, uh, I think you're awfully sexy. Blush, anyway. blush. Thank you. Thank you <laughs> okay. very much. Thanks a lot, Bert, and Cummings. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure.